Welcome to the Worth Listening Podcast, where we focus on having positive and productive conversations around money. I'm your host, Lauren, a four-time Olympian and certified financial planner. On this show, my guests share their money stories. Everyone has a unique story and experiences both wins and losses when it comes to money. My intent is to give listeners something they can relate to, something that builds their courage to be open and take control of their own money story. When I'm not creating a great show for my listeners, I'm running my company, Worth Winning, where I help individuals and families organize their finances. Check us out at worth-winning.com. All right, now on with the show. Hey, hey, what do you say? It is almost tax day. Yes, it is right around the corner, but it is not too late. One, to get your taxes done on time. Two, to file an extension if you know you're not going to be ready. Or three, plan what you're going to do with your tax return. You see, a lot of people have the wrong mindset about their tax return. They think it's free money. And that sounds really exciting. Like, oh my goodness, I'm getting this free money. I just don't know what I'm going to do with it. But your tax return isn't free money. Uncle Sam is not just sending you a chunk of money every year. The money you are getting is your money. It is part of the money you worked really hard to earn last year. It is part of your income, not free money at all. It's income that the government took from you. If they take too much, they give some back, and it's not money that's just falling out of the sky. It is, in fact, your income. So just be mindful. Tax day is around the corner, and your tax return can be used for something productive. All right. Today, our guest is Che Scott. So Che and I, we go way back, all the way back to the University of Miami, where he played football and I ran track. Che is an exemplary gentleman. I am so happy to have met him and to have had him as an example of what chivalry really looks like. He's currently an author, a speaker, and an MBA chaplain. He's the founder of not one, but two organizations, the Honor Movement, which focuses on teaching honor and respect among youth. And he's also the founder of the New Guy Code which is helping to shape the way boys are taught to view and treat girls. It's really amazing that he's teaching other young men how to live a life in the same example that I've always seen him treat ladies. I'm really excited to have Che on today to talk his money story. It's super unique and he's very transparent. So without further ado, let's get to it. Che, thanks so much for being on the show today. I just told everyone a little bit about you and what you're up to now, but every story has an introduction. So tell us a little bit about where it all got started for you. Well, my family originally is from Jamaica. So we're from this parish called Clarendon, which is about an hour and 15, hour and a half inside of Kingston. So pretty rural upbringing. Parents were pretty much born into farming families. And so it was a complete different way of life. You kind of grew what you ate and raised what you ate. And so that's a big part of my upbringing is that rural heritage. Um, Grandma, grandfather were farmers. And so that's always, even though I wasn't necessarily raised that way, that's definitely a big part of who I am. So you didn't spend all days out in the fields growing stuff. You're not like an expert at agriculture. No, not at all. I'm thankful to have been raised with rural values, but I came to America when I was nine years old. A lot of my upbringing is actually within the United States in South Florida in particular. Gotcha. Do you have any siblings? I do. I have two siblings, uh, two brothers, one older, one younger. So I'm the middle. Aha, the middle child. So do you have like real middle child syndrome? Is that a thing or no? I don't know if it's a thing or not. My older brother acts like a younger brother, so I don't think I ever got the benefit of being a middle brother. (laughs) (laughs) Wonder what he would say if he heard that, huh? (laughs) All right. Can you share with us some of the childhood memories that you have about money, the environment that you grew up in, the things that you saw around you, any values you might have been taught, whatever memories you have about money as a child? Because of how my parents were raised, being from uh, just in, in Jamaica and from the country, and I think we weren't as caught up in the American lifestyle of buying everything just for the sake of having it or trying to compare. 
when you're raised in a rural context, you kind of know exactly what you need to survive. So you kind of spend money on what you need as opposed to just randomly spending money. Even though I was always taught simplicity, I've probably veered off a lot more than my parents have, but that's definitely a part of my roots. Growing up, I think we always were in a house where we had everything that we needed. Probably one of the memories that I have, those are after 9-11, as a kid, you don't really understand what's going on, but you notice that some of the, like, we always had the food that we needed, but you notice some of the extra snacks and stuff like that weren't as always around, you know? So I think everyone got a little bit more careful around that time. So that was one of the memories for me for, as a child, I'll say living in South Florida. Having lived in a rural area, pets are something that a lot of people end up remember growing up with. And when you're a kid, you don't really think of the expense that goes along with having a pet, but living in a rural area, did you have Pets? And how did you guys think of pets? Yeah, pets become a part of the family as far as the dogs are there to serve as an alarm system. So if the dog barks in the middle of the night, that means that somebody is walking on the property and you kind of grew up, you see animals that were in the pen, the pigs, the donkeys. I mean, you'd see everything, chickens, roosters. That's usually how you woke up in the morning because a rooster set off the alarm. Did you eat your pets is a question that I have. That's why most of them were there. Oh, no. And did the dogs get to be in the house? Sometimes. I think the smaller ones did, but the big ones definitely were. They can't protect the house if they're inside the house. I just know a big part of Caribbean culture is having dogs or dogs being kind of like neighborhood dogs, if you will, but dogs belong outside, not inside. And with me having Trinidadian roots, I very much was aware of how dogs are treated differently there. And they're loved and cared for just like outside. Exactly. <laughs> Whereas I'm like an indoor, you know, I could never leave my pet outside. My dog like uses the bathroom, turns around, comes right back and is like, uh, excuse me, pardon me, could you let me in right now? So you know, just like wondered how the expense of pets or how pets might have been handled. <laughs> like no, no. I mean, the dog eats what the family eats, the leftovers. And that's usually how you're raised. So there's not the traditional going to the store to buy a big bag of feed or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> expenses were low because they got the leftovers. Nothing went to waste. Yeah. Yeah. What about like an allowance? Did you get an allowance or was there conversations in the household about money and how you should be responsible with it or not? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if we got an allowance. My parents were very good about giving us what we needed, but I think we valued the work that they did because when my father initially came to America in the late 80s as an immigrant, you do what you need to do to survive and to take care of your family. So you kind of grew up knowing that everything was a privilege, you know, so you don't waste stuff. You don't throw away stuff. You got the shoes that you needed especially as we got a little bit older into our teenage years, if we wanted all the cool shoes, then we went and did something and worked to get the money to get those shoes. So we didn't think that we we're just going to get Jordans and all this stuff because we we're just going to tell dad to go get a Jordan because we valued the work that he did. That brings up a good point. If you want something nicer, then you're going to have to go find some sort of work to get that nicer thing. So can you talk about some of the ways that you earned money during childhood or first jobs you had? things like that? I uh, bagged groceries. I think I was 15 years old at a grocery store when I was younger. I worked at McDonald's when I was younger. Even as I got into my first year or two of college, being a waiter, even before that, even doing little side construction projects, going to help out on the weekend, whether picking up material off the ground for a roof or something like that, I, I kind of did whatever I could to make a few extra dollars. So you had all kinds of hustles. Yeah. Yeah. Is it true that Jamaicans always have three jobs? <laughs> I don't know about that, but I definitely work ethic is definitely not missing from my heritage. Yeah, I think that is the point that uh, people are always trying to drive home when they make that joke is the culture is very much ingrained in having a really good work ethic. And I think that that's something that's really important as opposed to just calling it the three jobs. It's driving home the point of how cool it is that a whole culture can be so rooted and excited about having a really good work ethic. Yeah, that's the thing is that what people see of Jamaica is really two places. It's really the beach or the city in Kingston, but the majority of Jamaica is actually rural. So once you get out of the beach town or once you get out of Kingston, you're pretty much going into the country. And so the majority of Jamaica is raised with some kind of rural values. So the ability to actually bring in an income 
in an efficient way is a blessing. When that is provided and when someone is able to get that kind of opportunity, they don't take that for granted. Yeah, for sure. So what was your plan after high school? You went to high school, you talked about working a little bit during that time period, but did you have plans for college or scholarship opportunities? Was it even on your radar to go to college? Thankfully, when I was early on in high school, I met some really good friends and they were really serious about academics. And the idea of college was just a big thing. I knew that college had to be a part of my future. And so I kind of, someone like Shannon's in high school helped to broaden my thinking as far as what I do in um, college, where I go to college. So I think I always knew I wanted to go to college, even even though we're not old. And But it wasn't necessarily a given that everybody was going to go to college when we were leaving high school. Did they have any conversation with you about student loans or scholarships or how much it cost or how you were going to pay for it? Well, I don't know if we knew everything that went into college and the expenses and stuff like that. And honestly, had we have known a little bit more, and I think we were probably caught up in a whole generation of people who, you know, let's just, they'll give you the money, so take it. So I probably would have done college funding a little bit differently, looking back at the early 2000s and stuff like that. So we definitely were some mistakes made there. Got it. So you do have some student loans. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. If we sum up childhood college life, do you think there's anything or any instances where you can remember that really helped you prepare for your adult life? Because College is kind of like, I'm a grown up, but I'm not really a grown up. And then kind of after college is like, okay, well, look, we're probably still not grown ups. But <laughs> if you look back on that time period, is there anything in particular that stands out that helped you prepare for now? Again, going back to just the way that I was brought up, I wasn't born in America. And I will say this, growing up in the home that I grew up in, it was just the idea that we were going to work and to achieve something was incredibly important. So I think just the influence of my parents. They had always had a dream and they're actually at the point of now realizing that dream of moving back to Jamaica. I don't know if they'll be there full time, but they'll go back and forth of actually planning something for the future. So just watching them put a plan in place for what they would like the next 20, 30 years to look like. I think that was a big thing for me to try to have a plan for myself for the future. And then also have outside of my own home some good friends of mine who had brought up in different experiences. And when you're seeing a different aspect of life, it helped me to dream a little bit more about what life could look like with college and with hard work and stuff like that. I think that's awesome. That ability to plan because so frequently we don't see that or we don't have that example and people kind of peg millennials as the people who are living in the moment and never planning for the future. But the fact that that's the one thing that was driven home to you, I think is really, really awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're doing to plan and how you've gone about setting up a plan and what kind of goals you have and how you've made plans around that? Yeah, absolutely. I'll be the first to admit that I'm certainly no expert at this. I've made my fair share of mistakes. You are an expert at your life. So yes. (laughs) I take far too many risks sometimes, but I think we all get to a point where you realize that anything can happen. You have to have a plan in place. So for me, it's thankfully, I have a lot of friends who work in financial planning. And so helping me to have a plan for what, what I want for the future, what I'd like my life to look like in the next couple of years. Like for instance, I love to travel. And so part of my book is about teaching boys to respect girls and just seeing the impact that has in different parts of the world. So a part of my vision is being able to travel and actually, if I could do anything I wanted today, I'd probably live a period of the year in South Africa and some parts of the year in Southeast Asia, just working alongside groups and organizations on that message. And that takes an actual plan. I don't think you could just say, I'm going to go live here and there and not have a reserve available. So yeah, it's, it's trying to figure out what would that look like in the next five years and how can that be achieved? That is pretty dope. So planning ahead to travel abroad. You've thought about it. You didn't just say like, well, I feel like going here today and I'm going to put on my credit card for you to rest out later. Right. It's like, okay, this is something I want to do. How much is it going to cost? Where can I get the budget from to be able to do this? And then let me start setting something aside so that I can, in fact, reach that goal. 
You brought up a, a point, though. I don't want to make sure we didn't get past this. You said, I am by no means an expert. I've made some mistakes. So let's just pause and talk about some of the financial failures that you've encountered and anything that you feel like somebody could learn a lesson from, because we definitely all don't get it all right. You know, we might be okay in the moment, but sometimes we've messed up some things in the past. And so could you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. I think going back again, our generation, thankfully that the generation beyond us is actually being alerted to this a little bit more, but I think we all got caught up in the college thing. You spend a bunch of money for college and then it'll pay for itself within two, three years. And that's not necessarily true. So I would have went about that a different way. But I can accept that it was a part of the idea at the time. I definitely have spent more money than I've saved. So that's something that I have to really look at. What does creating healthy habits around that to have a structured and healthy plan for saving money? And so I I think those are really my big things. And then one of the things I would say for me now, I try not to get caught up in the buying because I'm supposed to buy. Ultimately, do I really need to live in this area or live in that area? Like, for instance, the way that I envision living, I don't know if I need to have a a house in the suburbs if I'm going to be traveling all the time. I think a condo works way better for my lifestyle. And so it's not being caught up in, I have to go put down this amount of money and deplete all the money that I have in order to say, well, I've got this house when it's not even really practical. And it may be something different for someone else, but I know for me, I just don't want to get caught up in that. Yeah, I think it's a really important point to bring up. So frequently we get caught up with what's the next best thing that we're supposed to do or the next step to adulting or I've accomplished this, now I have to do that because that's what society says. And a lot of millennials are ditching the idea that you gotta be a homeowner, but there's still a lot of people that feel like it's the American dream and I have to do it because I'm a certain age and now I'm doing this and we're gonna have a family. And there's all these pressures that the world puts on you to say like, you have to do this thing because And when I talk to clients sometimes and really talk about why they want to purchase a home, you find out that they only want to do it because it's the next best step, not because it's something they actually want or desire for themselves. So it's really important to be able to tap into that and know this is what's good for me, not for what everyone else says is good for me. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you just think about the practicality of all that stuff. One thing I've just I've gotten caught up is we have to be careful of. We really buy homes with this idea that we're going to have this thing going on and the people are going to come and they're going to stay here. And like, for instance, an apartment, I was going to get extra bedrooms because I had a relative come in this day and I had a friend come in that day. And I sat back and I thought it through. I'm like, if I just paid for them to stay in a luxury hotel for the days that they're there, it's far less than me paying extra to have this extra room that nobody uses 300 days a year. It makes no sense. Yes. That is the money hack. I was going to ask as a question next, like, what's your money hack? But I am saying that that is your money hack because I tell clients that all the time. You could get an Airbnb right down the street from your place and pay for it for those guests and still be spending less money than you would, like you said, be paying out of your pocket on a monthly basis to have an extra room in the house. I think that is an awesome thing to have realized and know and understand. So what would you say, though, to someone who has bumped into some sort of mistake and maybe feeling ashamed, they're not sure what to do? How does someone reset themselves after having made a financial mistake? With anything that we do in life, we just have to learn and we have to move on. The real mistake is going back and doing the same thing. over and over. The biggest issue with our generation, with our culture and the future and myself, I have to keep an eye on it, is that we don't get caught up in buying stuff to be able to show stuff. Because we're such a showy culture where everybody kind of shows the highlights of their life is to not get caught up in buy to show, but buy what I need. And I think going back to my rural upbringing, what are the things that I absolutely need uh, to survive? Now, there are things that I really, really like as well. And I think that's important. I think it's being happy and comfy and all that kind of stuff, but not being caught in the cycle of buying this because other people are going to like it and people are going to compliment me. Yeah, for sure. Don't keep up with the Joneses. Do what's appropriate for you. What kind of discussions are you having with your friends, your family members? Is it an open dialogue to talk about money? Is there kind of a wall or a barrier up? How deep are you able to go with your friends? Have you ever had those awkward conversations? I do have a lot of friends who work in the field. So that's been incredibly helpful. But there tends to be a level of awkwardness talking about there's the vulnerabilities 
we met a lot of people could say, I really made a mistake here. That was a bad idea. We do have to be more forgiven and open and comfortable talking about these things so that we don't make future mistakes because I think we all learn from other people's mistakes as well. All right, cool. So we've taken a little look at your past. We've paused and we've talked about the present and how you're setting goals. What letter grade would you give yourself with how organized you are with your finances right now? Oh man, I'd probably say a low B, honestly. Ah, low B. Okay. So we're going to skip to what we usually do as the last question in light of that. Can you tell me one thing that you would like to improve about your finances in the upcoming year? I think better just keeping track of where money goes. Last year, I traveled so much and I felt like I was on a plane more than I was on the ground. And it's so easy. Here, credit card for coffee, credit card for lunch, credit card for... And you think you have an idea of how much you're spending throughout the day, but you really don't. There's always more that's been gone out than you thought that you spent. And even if you change the currency, you always feel like the idea that I have to spend all this money because I changed it into some foreign currency. So I think it will be in a little bit more <laughs> disciplined about that. I'm feeling you 100% on that one. I'm currently in Buenos Aires and it is a lot more of a cash culture. So it's one of the first times where I haven't been able to use my card constantly And it's been really cool to have that awareness of like money actually leaving your hand and realizing like, well, dang, well, this morning I had, hold hold on now. I think what you convict us about that as well, the same thing I was in Colombia last week and you start to spend so much money that you almost feel like people are stealing from you. And it's like, no, no one's stealing from me. It's me. I'm giving this money away all the time, you know? And you're like, how do I have so much less than I started with this morning? Yes, because you spent it. And yeah, that's one of the downfalls or the pitfalls of cards in general is that you don't feel it when it leaves. You just swipe and you don't see any immediate impact. And I think that's why a lot of people are ending up in trouble with credit card debt and stuff like that. Absolutely. All right. So now we are on what I like to call the final sprint. I'm going to rapid fire some questions at you and you rapid fire some answers back at me. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> I'm testing your ability to sprint, Jay. Don't let me down. <laughs> I'm not a good sprinter, but we'll see. (laughs) All right. You got $20 in your pocket right now. What do you spend it on? At least four of it on coffee. (laughs) Four dollars on coffee. Yeah. Well, (laughs) this is why you get the cash in your hand. Like four dollars on some coffee. Actually, 316. So I try to justify it by saying it totally. (laughs) It's terrible. So you know you're drinking. You drink it regularly. You know exactly how much it costs. (laughs) Exactly. All right. Best advice you've ever received. Major on major things, minor on minor things. Major on major things and minor on minor things. There are things that we have to deal with that are real and have real consequences. The majority of the stuff that we deal with don't really have that much consequence and not to make a huge deal about things that don't have tremendous consequence. Yes, I love it. All right. What's your best money habit? I'm not an impulse buyer. So if I buy something, I probably have been scouting it for a few days, a week, a month or something like that. I don't tend to just run in and buy something. I don't, well, I'm here now, so I need to buy it now because I'll never get to buy it again. I'd rather really think, do I really, really need this? Because I don't hoard, but even I can look at some of the stuff that I have. I'm like, what am I doing with this? Right. Not to accumulate stuff. So I think that's the the ability not to do stuff and just feel the need to buy it. Okay. Something you do for fun that doesn't cost anything. Exercise. Exercise. I like it. All right. You have passed the test. You did a really good job of sprinting. Okay. I'm going to let you stand on the podium. And now it's your time to shine. Tell everybody all about what you have going on, where we can find you, how we can support you. Go for it. So I mentioned earlier that i uh, actually going to be publishing a book this year. Uh, it's actually called Honor, the New Guide Code. So the whole emphasis is on teaching boys the importance of honoring and respecting girls and girls, the idea of respecting themselves. So that um, is actually under uh, the website, newguidecode.com, which is actually being moved to honormoves.com. So that's H-O-N-O-R-M-O-V-E-S.com. And so that's a whole list of values that we think that the, the emerging generation grasp these values, then we can see a, a completely different future and a completely different culture of people in the next 20 to 30 years. I love it. I love it. Teaching gentlemen to respect ladies and teaching ladies to respect themselves. That is so, so, so important. 
Che, thanks so much for being on the show today, for dropping all the nuggets of wisdom. And I can't wait to pick up the new book. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed listening to Che's Money Memoir. He shared so much good information with us. And while I almost want to make the word of the day chivalry, but because it's almost tax day and I want you all to be awesome, not broke, I want to tell you a few tax tips. So word of the day, we're just going to call it tax day. We talked about the tax return at the top of the show. I reminded you that it is income, not free money, but I wanted to give you a few ideas to what to do with that income. Since it's not money that you typically have a plan for, it is important to make a plan for it. And it's not the YOLO plan, but it is a plan to further your financial stability. A few things you can do with your tax return. One, build up an emergency fund. I talk about it all the time. A lot of people say they don't have one. They would love to have one. This is a great opportunity to put some money aside in savings to create a financial cushion. Two, pay down some credit card debt. Credit card debt has ridiculous interest rates and it is something that can definitely prohibit you from creating financial stability and then moving from financial stability to wealth. So if you got credit card debt, this is a great opportunity to be able to put a good debt in it and possibly even pay it all off. Number three, add to your retirement savings. So we always say we want to retire early. We don't want to be working in this job for the next 30 years. Well, how are we going to get there? If we want to retire, we've got to have something to live off of. And if you're just doing the employer match right now, you're not doing enough. You've got to save up enough so that you can have something to live off of. And your tax return is a great way to ramp up your retirement savings and not feel the hit what's coming out of your paycheck. And last but not least, invest in yourself. Whether that is reading a book, a podcast, taking a class, cooking, a language, singing lessons, workshop, seminar, you name it, we've all got something that we want it to do and will make us either a happier, more productive individual or will really add to the value that we can bring to others and the world. Make sure that you are investing in yourself. You might have a side hustle that you want to turn into your full-time job. Your tax return could be the investment you need to take that jump. All right, I'm off my tax return soapbox now. You know the drill. If you have financial questions, suggestions for guests, or you would like to share your own money memoir, please contact us through our website, worth-listening.com.